Hi everyone, welcome to the meetup. Uh, I'm Martin Goodson. I'm from Evolution AI, who is sponsoring the meetup. And uh, today we have JY Co from Carnegie Mellon talking to us about a, a, a really exciting paper um, about grounding language models to, to images for multimodal generation. Uh, as usual, we'll have a 40 minute talk. And uh, after the 40 minute talk, we will have a QA uh, session for about 20 minutes. That's going to be handled by Harold Lee at UCLA today. Um, so thanks, Harold. Uh, and uh, as usual, please put your questions in the QA function of Zoom. Don't use the chat, use the QA. Uh, and raise your hand if you want to ask your question yourself. Uh, and then um, it, you're more likely to get your question asked if you if you do raise your hand, I have to say. Um, that will all be handled by my colleague, Alessio, who's one of the organizers of the um, Meetup 2, also from Evolution AI. Um, and yeah, I think we're ready to go. So I'm going to hand over to, to JY. Thanks, JY. Thanks, Martin. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today sharing our recent paper, Grounding Language Models to Images for Multimodal Generation. And this work was done with my advisors, Ruslan Salahuddinov and Daniel Fried at Carnegie Mellon. So I think all of us or most of us have experienced the very impactful changes in large language models as of late. Large language models are very impressive general models. They can be prompted to argue about their reasoning and improve on math problems. They can be prompted in specific ways to elicit certain kinds of outputs. And they can generate very long and coherent stories um, conditioned on complex descriptions. So one example is from GPT-3 or chat GPT in the middle here where it can generate like a very long and coherent story given a very complex description provided to it. Large language models can also improve our efficiency in programming. Large language models of code such as GitHub Copilot make us more efficient and faster at programming. And uh, more recently, people have also tried to integrate large language models into other information retrieval systems like Bing or Google Bard. And although they're very impressive, I think one of the drawbacks of such models is that they are very resource intensive. So these models are amazing. They do incredible things, but they require thousands of GPUs or TPUs to be trained. And most of us like just don't have that resource unless you work at an industry lab. The other drawback is that a lot of language models, even though this is changing um, day by day, most language models take in text and they produce text. So they're unable to process images or produce images. Um, and you know, obviously there are exceptions like GPT-4 as of late and, and such, but for the most part, most capable large language models can't handle visual input. Several areas of research have tried to address this. So one area in improving resource efficiency of large language models is on parameter efficient adaptation. So one line of work is prefix tuning. And in this line of work, you learn a prefix embedding for every attention layer in the transformer to allow it to adapt to new tasks. So almost the entire model is kept frozen and you tune just a few vectors at every attention layer to allow the model to adapt to new tasks without um, excessive computation resources. So for this one, it's very efficient. 99.9% .9 of the model is kept frozen and it's able to perform um, very close to fine tuning the entire model. Prompt tuning is also a very similar idea to prefix tuning, but instead of learning a prefix for every layer, you learn just one prefix for the input embeddings. And other work has also explored more complex methods like low rank adaptation, where you inject trainable matrices into transformer layers. And this allows you to adapt the model without training the whole thing. On improving text only large language models for multimodal tasks, several papers have also tackled this from the lens of uh, efficient adaptation. So Frozen was a paper from DeepMind where they did prefix tuning to adapt text only large language models for image captioning. Almost the entire model is kept frozen. 95% of it is kept frozen. And they fine tune just this visual encoder to allow the model to process images as if they were text embeddings. This model is capable of compelling few shot multimodal reasoning, achieving very competitive scores on things like vision question answering and other um, few shot tasks that it wasn't trained for. The Flamingo paper was also an extension of the Frozen paper where they train more complex perceiver resemblers and cross attention layers to allow the model to handle a bunch of different tasks. So this model. Um, achieves very impressive capabilities on very different multimodal tasks, and it achieves state-of-the-art on many of these benchmarks. Um, but the drawback with a lot of these existing multimodal models is that they take in images and text and they produce text. So GPT-4, which was released uh, like a week ago, 
um, is also in the same line of capabilities. It takes in images and possibly text or text and possibly images and it produces just text. There has also been analysis along this line of work that explores how visually grounded text-only large language models are. So the question here is that we have a large language model trained on text-only data and we want to know how um, grounded the representations are to visual space. So previous work have shown that pre-trained text-only language models and pre-trained visual encoders are uh, actually functionally equivalent up to a linear mapping. So by training just a linear mapping, you can allow a frozen image encoder to map into a frozen large language model and it can um, be relatively competitive on things like image captioning and uh, visual question answering. In our work, we explore whether we can ground text-only large language models to not only produce, uh, to not only consume visual data like previous work has, but also whether we can produce visual data. So our model is able to consume image and text inputs and produce image and text inputs. And we do this with our model called Fromage, Frozen Retrieval Over Multimodal Data for Autoregressive Generation. Fromage is a model that is capable of passing image and text inputs and producing image and text outputs. So it's able to do multimodal concept composition. For example, given a photo of a motorcycle, I can say something like at the beach and it will generate or it will retrieve an image of a motorcycle that corresponds to the input prompts. And it does uh, similar things for style transfer and, and other things like that. So if I have an image of a cat and I say uh, gouache painting, it can retrieve the relevant image of a cat in the desired style. And you will notice here that we never explicitly use the word motorcycle or cat. Um, we just put in a relevant image and the model is able to pass the image as well as the text that I input to it. Um, it's able to composite both the image context and the text context and produce the relevant image that is aligned to both modalities. Fromage is also capable of multimodal dialogue. So condition on images and text, it can produce human-like dialogue in response to the inputs. So on the right, you can see that every gray bubble is a user input. Every green bubble is a model generated output. And it's able to respond to questions asked about the image as well as uh, produce images when prompted to. So Fromage is a new way of interacting with language models that allows you to um, pro pro produce as well as consume visual outputs. So it's able to condition on multimodal inputs and produce multimodal outputs. Fromage leverages the abilities of pre-trained text-only large language models, and these include in-context learning, sensitivity to input prompts, and their ability to generate long and coherent dialogue. Our method is model agnostic, and we use a 6.7 billion parameter large language model, but it can be in principle applied to any larger model and any stronger large language model released in the future. Fromage is also very resource efficient. So the whole model consists of mostly frozen parameters and we train just three linear layers to adapt a text-only large language model to enable image captioning, image retrieval, and a whole bunch of other downstream uh, few short multimodal tasks. The whole model is trained on a single GPU in 24 hours. So it's much more efficient than most existing methods. Um, and it's able to leverage a lot of the pre-trained models abilities. So how does Fromage work? Fromage is trained on two different tasks. The first is image captioning. Given an image and as an associated caption with the image, we encode the image with a frozen visual encoder. Um, this maps the image to a single vector representation, image one. We similarly tokenize the caption using a pre-trained tokenizer from a large language model. And we append this to the image vector. This entire thing goes into a frozen large language model that was originally pre-trained on just text. The large language model is trained to predict the next token of the input embeddings. So it's supposed to predict the generated caption given the image inputs and every word that it has generated before that. This entire thing is trained with the cross entropy loss for next token prediction, which is a standard loss for image captioning. Aside from image captioning, which allows the model to learn how to process images and text, Fromage is also capable of retrieving images from text. So we have to train it on image text retrieval. And the difficulty here is that a lot of state-of-the-art image text retrieval models, such as Clip and Align, they usually use encoder-based language models which have bi-directional attention. So this is a lot more expressive than the autoregressive models that we use. Um, and the reason we have to use autoregressive models is that we primarily care about text and um, image generation. So we can't attend bi-directionally because you, you, um, it's a causal attention model. 
So the way that we adapt an autoregressive language model for this is that we learn a special RET token for retrieving images. So this is a special token that was not in the original language model. We add this special token to the um, new language model and we train its embeddings. The model is, learned, is trained to learn to generate RET whenever it's appropriate. And we show that including this RET token improves retrieval by 37% over having no RET token. So this not only allows the model to improve on retrieval, but it also allows the model to decide when it wants to re retrieve images. And it can interleave text with RET tokens which represent images. Image text retrieval operates in the following way. So given an input image and an input caption, we first append the special RET token to the end of the input caption. Similarly as before, the input image goes into a frozen visual encoder. This produces a vector representation of the image. So every image is represented by a vector for the sake of image text retrieval. Similarly, we pass the input caption through the frozen large language model and extract the embedding of the RET token, which we learn through training. So given the visual vector and the RET vector, we run the info NCE loss over these two things, which is a standard loss for image text retrieval models. Um, this allows the model to learn RET embeddings that are close in semantic space to Im input images. So whenever I want to produce an RET token, it can be used to retrieve a relevant image. And this is trained using the info NCE loss as shown on the bottom right. Uh, we also train the model to predict the next token prediction as before. And the purpose of this is to allow the model to learn when to generate the RET token. So we find that during inference time, the model is able to produce RET tokens whenever it thinks it's appropriate. And it's able to interleave these RET tokens into text that it generates. So that's how Fromage works. It's trained on these two tasks, but it's a lot more general because most of the model is frozen. It retains a lot of its compelling abilities like a uh, few short abilities in context learning and so on. So we find that even though our training loss is very simple, it's able to generalize to a whole bunch of different multimodal tasks. So quantitative evaluation on this model is uh, very difficult because multimodal dialogue, which is probably the most compelling ability of Fromage, is something that is very difficult to measure and there doesn't really exist a canonical benchmark for this. So we evaluate it on a few different benchmarks. The first one is visual storytelling. So the task here that we ask for much to do is contextual image retrieval, meaning given a visual story consisting of images interleaved with text, for example, in, uh, shown here is a visual story consisting of four images and four descriptions. Um, I went on a desert tour over the summer and um, there's some image that corresponds to that. This is our caravan as we left and there's a different image that corresponds to that and so on. So condition on these four images and these five texts, Fromage is tasked to retrieve the last image in the input. So this is a difficult task because it requires conditioning on all the text descriptions in the story before. Um, it requires conditioning on the image inputs that are interleaved directly into the text. So what Fromage sees is text, image, text, image, and so on. And it's supposed to retrieve the last image that corresponds to both the story as well as the images that are provided. Because you might imagine that there's multiple images that would correspond to the last caption here, but only a few are stylistically appropriate for the story that I've been given. So we see that Fromage is actually um, one of the first retrieval models that is directly applicable to process multimodal inputs. So given one caption, um, we show that Fromage is actually worse than clip when you provide just the last, just the fifth caption for retrieval. But as you start to increase the context length, Fromage starts to outperform Clip significantly. So when you provide just the five text inputs to Clip and to Fromage, Clip actually gets worse in performance because it's unable to handle long and complex descriptions. But Fromage actually gets better because it's a language model that's able to pass these complex and temporally coherent descriptions. When we start to include image inputs to the inputs of both Clip and Fromage, we see that the performance of Fromage goes up even further. So when it's conditioned on five captions and four images, um, it gains almost a 50% improvement over the baseline model, which um, achieves 10.4 with just the text inputs. So we see here that it's able to process multimodal inputs quite coherently, and it's able to retrieve images that are um, generally more accurate compared to Clip. And of, of course, Clip-like models, they can't really process image and text inputs. And um, so for these kind of tasks, they are not very appropriate. The other, dialogue, the other evaluation that we do is on visual dialogue. So visual dialogue is a task such that you're given an image and you're given a series of Q&A question and answer pairs about the image. 
And the goal is to answer the last question about the image. So for example, given this uh, green image of a bathroom, um, I'm given a series of Q&A question and answers about it. And the goal of the evaluation is to answer the last question. So is it light or dark in the bathroom? The correct answer is something like, it is dark. Um, and so that's the desired output. We also benchmark image retrieval condition on this Q&A pairs. And um, in this setting, we have 10 Q&A pairs. Um, our model is supposed to retrieve the correct image that corresponds to the Q&A conversation. And this is a difficult task because usually the image is never explicitly described in the conversation. So um, over here, you can ask questions like, is there grass? Um, is the horse wearing a saddle? But there isn't a clear caption-like description of the image, which makes this task difficult for retrieval models because you're supposed to pass a very long and uh, complex description of the dialogue. So from these two tasks, we benchmark against CLIP and other models that tackle visual dialogue. So on the I image text to text task, where we are supposed to answer a question about the image, we see that Fromage is competitive with uh, other zero-shot models on recall. So recall at one, it actually out outperforms Esper and other models like Clip and Bilbert. But we see that it's actually um, slightly worse on mean reciprocal recall and normalized discounted cumulative gain compared to Esper. And uh, we expect that this is because of training differences. Um, so Esper actually trains on MS Coco, which is more appropriate for visual dialogue. And it uses reinforcement learning, which probably allows it to learn better distributions. On the text to image retrieval task, we see that Fromage actually outperforms Clip once again. Um, and again, this is likely because it's able to pass these long and complex Q&A dialogue examples, whereas Clip can't because it's a smaller model that was trained on caption-like data. And um, models like Flamingo and Asper, they are actually incapable of this task because they can't produce images in their outputs. And you will notice that Flamingo actually outperforms all other models greatly on NDCG um, because it's, a, it, it's larger by several orders of magnitude and it's trained on a lot more data. Um, so that's very impressive. But again, um, these prior models, they can't produce images. So they are limited in the types of tasks they can do. And um, we think that from Marsh is a more general model that's capable of a bunch of different downstream tasks. Uh, and there's a lot of potential for scaling up like Flamingo in the future. The other evaluation that we run is human evaluations. So text generation is always a bit tricky to evaluate because the metrics don't always represent the model very well. Um, so human evaluation is kind of the gold standard here. And we run an ablation experiment where we evaluate text generation from humans. So again, this is the visual story. This is the visual storytelling data set. We are given this time five images and four text descriptions. They are again interleaved. So you have image text, image text, and, and so on. And the goal is to generate a coherent story for the last image. So we run three different settings here. The first one is that the model from Marsh in this case is provided with just the last image. So the fifth image, and it's supposed to generate a caption. The last one is it's provided, the next one is that it's provided with just the text descriptions and it's supposed to generate the text description for the last image. And the final case is where it's provided with the full multimodal context. So it's given five images, four captions, and it's supposed to generate the uh, corresponding last caption. So we see that actually humans um, prefer the model condition of multimodal context. And they rate that these text generation outputs are more coherent when viewed with the entire story. So the resulting output is more coherent than when the model just has access to the image or just has access to the previous descriptions. The model with multimodal context is also, also generates more relevant descriptions as compared to the image. Um, so allowing access to all five images allows the model to generate more relevant descriptions compared to when the model conditions are just the text inputs. And we see that actually when the model has just the last image, the generated outputs are more relevant to the image than when you have the full context. And we believe this is because the model is generating very caption-like outputs when you provide just one image. So visual storytelling, visual storytelling is a very kind of subjective data set where a lot of the outputs are very story-like. So things like we saw emus near the road. Um, when we saw the lighthouse, we knew we were there. So these are not very factual, but they follow a certain style that Fromage is only able to emulate when you provide the full multimodal context. So even though the generated captions are less factual, they, we observe qualitatively that they seem to follow the style of visual stories a lot more. Um, and this is why they're not as relevant as a single image, but still more relevant than having just text descriptions. 
We also run several ablation experiments on our model. So the first one is on exploring the effect of context with image retrieval. So this is on the visual storytelling image retrieval tasks. And we see that when one caption is provided as input to Fromage, it's able to retrieve the relevant image about 8.9% of the time. When five captions are provided, this improves to about 11%. Um, but interestingly, when you provide two captions and one image instead of five captions, the retrieval recall is much higher than having five captions. So the story here is that multimodal context um, or being able to condition on image and text inputs is a lot more valuable than having text only inputs. So having just two captions and one image allows you to achieve better performance than having five text only captions. And we see that as the amount of multimodal context improves, increases, the retrieval performance also improves um, accordingly. And best, the best performance is when you have the full visual story multimodal context of five descriptions and four images. We see a similar story on visual dialogue. So retrieval performance also improves the more rounds of Q&A dialogue you have. And shown here are the clip model and our model. We see that clip plateaus around five rounds of dialogue, whereas our model improves beyond five rounds. So it, it achieves its best performance around nine or 10 rounds of dialogue, while clip kind of stagnates around five rounds. And again, we believe this is because our model is able to process more complex and coherent uh, and longer descriptions compared to clip, which was trained on caption-like data. So again, the story here is that uh, more context allows our model to perform better because it's a large language model that is mostly frozen. We also find that freezing the large language model is actually essential to retaining a lot of its few short abilities. So if you instead fine tune the large language model rather than keeping it frozen, um, this leads to better training and validation loss on the, on the objectives that we train on. Um, so it achieves better image captioning loss and it achieves better image retrieval performance but it loses its in-context learning ability and it can no longer perform well on the few short tasks that we, that we benchmarked it on before. So things like visual storytelling, which includes multiple images and multiple captions, fine-tuning the model uh, destroys performance. Um, it goes from 12.8 recall to 6.2. And similarly on visual dialogue, um, the fine-tuned model actually can't handle these complex and long descriptions anymore. So performance drops from 14.6 to one. Yeah, so we, we observe that freezing is actually very essential to retaining the in-context learning abilities of these models. Next, I'd like to show some qualitative results from Fromage, which I think is, um, so I think one of the highlights of this model is its ability to produce multimodal dialogue. So all of these examples are generated from the model. The green bubbles indicate model generated outputs and the gray bubbles indicate user prompts. So it's able to do co-referencing. So for the example on the left, you can see that um, the input is something like, I'm thinking of an animal, it is brown and furry. Um, but the interesting thing is when, when, when you ask Fromage to show you an illustration of a beaver, it does so. Um, and you can say something like, what about a pencil drawing of one? Fromage is able to pass this sentence in relation to the past conversation history and understand that the one here corresponds to the beaver. So it's able to show a pencil drawing of a beaver and you can continue to prompt it and say things like, uh, what about a photo of one? And it's able to... Uh, similarly produce a photo of a beaver rather than an illustration of a, or, or a pencil drawing. Fromage is also able to provide very helpful visual aids. So for example, you can ask it on um, instructions on how to cook. Um, it will tell you like how to make macarons. And one of the difficult things about making macarons is trying to figure out like um, whether your egg whites should be, uh, you, so you need to beat egg whites until they're stiff peaks but that's not very intuitive to explain in words. So models like Fromage can produce images which will allow you to more easily understand what stiff peaks, stiff peaks mean. Um, and so, you know, it's helpful in, in cases like this. We also experimented with allowing the model to condition on longer image prefixes. So if you recall in the training objective, the images are squashed to a single vector and they're fed into the model as inputs. We experimented with representing images as longer sequences instead. So if you express the image as a sequence of four vectors, we find that its ability to process input images greatly improves. So one example that I was personally quite impressed by was the second one. So this is a political cartoon representing some country as an octopus. So if you ask from Marsh what is the cartoon about, it's able to understand that it's, um, it, it's not like a literal cartoon. It's actually about the political and economic power of some country. 
and it knows that this country is being portrayed as a giant octopus. So increasing the visual prefix improves dialogue generation in general. Um, it improves the ability of the model to pass more complex images. And um, this leads to more satisfying dialogue in many cases. Other than dialogue settings, Fromage is also capable to learn in context to produce very different outputs. So visual storytelling is one example that I've used throughout this presentation. Um, we have a series of text and image inputs. So you have something like people start to arrive for the cookout and I have a corresponding image. So Fromage is able to pass this very long multimodal context and produce similar outputs to the one that you have seen before. So it's able to learn in context that uh, you're supposed to produce story-like outputs and um, it's able to generate things that are very relevant for the story. So it, in this case, it generated something like the burgers and sausages will cook to perfection, um, blah, 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 and it produces a relevant image for the story. Fromage is also able to tap on the world knowledge that is learned through text-only pre-training. So even though some of these words, such as versus, actos, horribilis, were never seen in the pre-training data set, which is um, conceptual captions 3 million, it's able to understand that this corresponds to I think, I think this is a brown bear. So I verified this, that this is correct. So it's able to understand that this is a brown bear um, and it's able to retrieve the relevant image condition on this input. So even though it never saw this explicitly in its multimodal fine tuning step, it's able to tap onto the knowledge of the frozen large language model to process things like that. So it's under, it understands knowledge about the world and it's able to use these facts in its downstream task. And lastly, another interesting application of Fromage is to enable interleaved text-to-image composition. So if I have a text-only data set, I can insert these special RET tokens into the text data set and allow the model to retrieve relevant images at the corresponding location. So if I say something like, this is my dog, this is it taking a bath, and this is us by the lake, even though the second description doesn't have dog or uh, it doesn't have dog in it, Fromage is able to pass this multimodal context and it's able to understand that I must retrieve an image of a dog taking a bath. So this is one possible way of bootstrapping a multimodal interleaved data set from text-only data. There are many avenues to take from Marsh in future work. So the first one is that we trained on conceptual captions 3 million. So this is about 3 million image text pairs. And um, this is quite small by modern standards. And during testing, we found that from Marsh is somewhat limited because it's a retrieval model. So it retrieves from just the 3 million images that we have, and we would probably get a lot more capabilities and more impressive outputs if we trained on larger data sets like Lion 400 million. An obvious way to improve from Marsh is to enable it to generate images from scratch rather than retrieving. So this would allow a lot more creative capabilities that are not constrained by our fixed image database. In from Marsh, we also kept things simple and use a, a linear mapping to train the model to map images to text and text to images. There's a lot of room for improving this from the modeling perspective by training more sophisticated image text mappings. So you could use adapters or fine tune cross attention layers or use um, rank decomposition as I mentioned before. And uh, you know, from Marsh is an agnostic framework. So we could also apply it to even larger language models and use stronger visual models to improve its performance on a variety of tasks. The model and code are all available online. So you can try the model on hugging face spaces. And the example on the right is one that I generated for this talk. So I asked it, I asked for much like, what's the difference between a biscuit in the US and the UK? Um, and it knows that in the US, a biscuit is a small round baked uh, good. Um, it's able to produce a biscuit-like image um, in the United States context. And it understands that in the UK, um, biscuits look like a different thing. They, they are actually a completely separate thing. So it's able to represent that and produce the correct outputs. So, um, you know, it's very interesting for tasks that require visual outputs. Um, I think that visual outputs are a lot more useful for certain types of dialogue and task settings. And uh, from Marsh is one step towards enabling large language models to do things like this. So I hope that this was an informative and interesting overview of from Marsh. Um, this is what I have to share about the paper, and you can find more details, code, model weights, and the demo at our webpage. So jyco.com slash fromarsh. Thanks so much, JY. Great talk. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Harold now for, for, for the QA session. So please, uh, audience members, please do add your questions to the QA function. 
I can see we've already got a couple. Um, yeah, keep them coming. And I'm going to hand over to Harold now. Yeah, all right. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Like, great talk. So I see there's one uh, question from the audience. Uh, so it asks in the slide 20, uh, how mm -hmm. to we train the multimodal where the input was multimodal with images and text and output was text. I guess the question is about what would, what's the goal, uh, what's the training data used there and how do we calculate the loss? Yeah, so there's two different loss functions being calculated. The first one is image captioning. So your input here is image and text and the loss here is the loss on generating text condition on images. So this is kind of like the standard image captioning loss. During training, you use teacher forcing the compute next token prediction and you optimize for max likelihood. So given like all previous tokens and images that you have seen, you try to predict the next token. Um, so that's kind of the first loss. The second one is image text retrieval. So this is computing. Uh, so you're, you're kind of like squashing images into vectors. You're extracting the corresponding representation of the caption also as a vector using the RET token and you compute the info noise contrastive estimation loss between these. So it's uh, optimizing for retrieval performance. So given an image, I try to find the text in the batch that is most aligned to that image. And um, actually both of these are standard losses. So uh, image captioning is it, um, used quite frequently in a lot of prior work like Frozen and Flamingo. Uh, image text retrieval loss is also quite standard from Clip. Um, but I think the difference here is that we combine both these losses and even though we don't have interleaved image text pairs, our model is able to generalize because it's mostly a frozen large language model. Um, so those are the two losses that we train on. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it uh, sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any more questions from the audience? Oh, so the audience uh, has a follow-up question. So is there any plan to apply on video data? Yeah, I think that's an interesting application. Um, so, it, so personally, I do not have plans at the moment to apply to video data, but I think it would definitely be a natural extension. So you might imagine that instead of embedding images as vectors, you could embed every frame as a vector and you pass in a very long sequence to the language model. Um, I'm curious like how well that will work. Um, I, I'm actually not very familiar on video processing, so um, it's possible that someone has already tried this, but uh, I agree that it would be very interesting and it would probably give you a lot more training data than image text examples that we have now. Okay, we've got another very interesting question is uh, when, when you use the pre-trained image embedding to indicate that mm -hmm. image tokens are different from the text tokens. Yeah, that's, um, um, that's a great question. So I think the question is asking uh, when we embed images, we embed them as like a vector. And uh, the question is whether they are, the model knows that these are visual embeddings. So the model is actually not, it's not explicit. So we do not explicitly tell the model that these are different from the text embeddings. So in the end, like everything here is a vector. Everything here is a vector of size 4096. So the model does not know that these image vectors are different from text vectors um, in the sense that we do not have a masking mechanism or something to tell it that these are like everything from four to eight index uh, text tokens or anything like that. So the model doesn't really know this. And I think the fact that we treat them the same way is why the model is able to use a lot of its uh, knowledge that it has learned from text only pre-training. So yeah, they are treated basically the same way. Um, but I think if you visualize the learn embeddings, the image vectors look slightly different from text embeddings. So the visual embeddings are usually higher in magnitude, um, probably because the captioning loss forces the model to attend to the image vectors more heavily than the text vectors. Yeah, so that's, that's the only difference um, that kind of emerged naturally. So we didn't enforce it or anything like that. Um. Uh, if there's, uh, so I think the audience can keep uh, asking questions. I can also ask one of my own. So I'm very interested in the design choice of the fusion or translation layer. So one of the yeah. very interesting thing is that you, you mentioned there are only three uh, linear layers and you, you need to choose. So that makes the model yeah. very efficient. 
So I wonder if there's uh, this design choice was also related to any empirical observation on the impact of the translation layer design or on the in-context learning ability. Because if you find mm -hmm. the language model, you lose the in-context learning ability. I yeah. wonder if you add more capacity to the translation layer or even you like represent image uh, each image as multiple uh, visual tokens, will that somehow mm -hmm. impair the in-context learning ability? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so I think early on we tried using, so like in the end, the model uses linear layers. Somewhere in between, we tried using uh, like multi-layer perceptrons, so multiple layers with non-linearities in between. And I recall that the performance was roughly the same as using linear layers, which is kind of why in the end we ended up like with the simpler choice. I think probably if you use like more complex mappings, so if you represented images as multiple vectors, um, what I've personally observed is that it does better on certain things like image captioning and dialogue about images, but it loses some of the other abilities like image retrieval. So image retrieval seems to suffer a bit when you um, have uh, more complex mappings because you know i guess you're optimizing it's able to optimize for the captioning loss a bit more so th there's like a balance i guess yeah but i think the primary reason we went for linear mappings is that it's uh, simpler and it's a nicer story i guess yeah i i totally agree i think um somehow like like the frozen also show some of this in context learning ability yeah. but i do wonder but they use much more compute so i wonder if this actually simpler design is a key to make the model work well for in-context learning rather than, I, I, I cannot recall frozen exactly, but I do think they represent each image as multiple tokens and the multiple could mean like hundred tokens. Yeah, so I think frozen also actually fine-tuned their visual encoder. So oh, I... we, did, we did something similar, but we found that because our model also does retrieval, fine-tuning doesn't have a huge effect on captioning, but it makes retrieval a lot worse probably because the batch size that we can fit into one GPU is very small. So um, like retrieval is very dependent on large batch sizes. Uh, so yeah, freezing the visual encoder in this case also helps because we want retrieval as well as captioning. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so, yeah that's very informative. Okay, we got another question from the audience. Um, does adding transformation on images make it more robust? Right, uh, so I think just to clarify, this question is like, does adding uh, like transformation meaning data augmentation on images? Yeah, I think the audience may, maybe can type another. Oh, okay, yes. Oh, I see. Uh, so I actually didn't really try this. Um, yeah, so I don't think I applied any special, I don't think I applied any augmentations to the images aside from random flipping. Um, so I don't have an ablation to answer this. I would expect that it does um, because augmentations almost always seem to help. Um, but I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't test this explicitly. I had a quick question actually, if I can uh, yeah. uh, interrupt a little Yeah, go ahead. In the, in the paper, JY, you, you talk about mm -hmm. random concatenation of images. Uh, right, yes. Can you explain a little bit about what that was? Yeah, yeah. So I guess that can also be kind of seen as a form of augmentation. Um, so that particular detail is not in this slide, but what we did in the paper is that actually, um, because a lot of the tasks that we care about involve interleaved images and text, uh, but we only have access to image text data. So we don't have like the kind of um, interleaved examples that uh, Flamingo has. So for example, things like this, this is a very cute dog, this is a um, grumpy cat. So what we did is we actually, for image captioning, we took two random examples from the training data set and we concatenated them. So what you will see is image one, image one caption, image two, image two caption. And we feed this sequence that is twice as long as a single example into the model. So it trains on this instead of training on one image text example. And we find that this seems to allow the model to um, generalize better. So it understands that even if there's multiple images in the sentence, it's able to learn which one it should attend to. So if my caption is like something about, so if I have this example of a plane and the second example is like of a cat, and I ask a question about a cat, it knows that I'm supposed to attend to the second image rather than the first one. So this is like 
uh, yeah, I guess this is the only augmentation that we do. So we randomly concatenate examples and we feed it into the into the model for captioning. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I actually have a follow up to that. So during training, mm -hmm. uh, how how many examples at most do you concatenate? Is it just uh, two? So, yeah. Yeah, so we con we do it at random. So half of the time you use just one example, half of the time you use two. So oh, it's at most two. Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting because at test time you actually show that you can actually generalize to even more than just two interleaved images and text. Yeah, I think Frozen also only use one image text pair and they show they can generalize. So I think this is, I think this is not a new finding, but we did find that concatenating two seems to help a bit. Um, and I think there's some, so the inspiration came from, I think, there's some like prior work in NLP from back translation that did something similar, I think. So they pack examples rather than do batches. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, if there's no more questions from the audience, I can also ask another one <laughs> I'm thinking about. So I think it, you are not showing it in the slide, but in the paper, you actually showed a very interesting example um, more of a reasoning ability that you show mm -hmm. examples similar to the we know grad. So I want to get results on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think I have the example here. Uh, so that one I thought was quite interesting, but um, I have to preface by saying that finding is not very robust. So the example that Harold is talking about is, um, there's this we know grad schema. So they change one word in the description and the model is supposed to do something different. So it might be something like the foxes the foxes have been chasing the chickens. They are getting very anxious. And the foxes are chasing the chickens. They are getting very daring. So depending on the sentence that you provide to the model, you're supposed to retrieve a different thing. So in the first example, when they are anxious, you're supposed to retrieve an image of a chicken. In the second one, you're supposed to retrieve an image of a fox. Um, so we did show that like Fromage is able to pass this somewhat. So on certain like qualitative examples, it's able to answer this correctly. Uh, and I think the reason that it's able to do this, I also attribute to the large language model because it's able to pass like more complex sentences compared to um, smaller text encoders like clip. So I think this is why it's more sensitive to context um, because it's a 6 billion parameter model that was frozen and trained on a lot of data. Yeah. Does, does that answer your question? Or yeah, I, I guess it's not more of a question, more like I just really <laughs> interesting that example. Yeah, I yeah, also I think I, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, I also wonder like how would that relate to the window ground data set? So they are very different, but I do wonder if this kind of uh, uh, approach will also benefit uh, challenging data sets like window ground. Yeah, I think I think it would. Um, I think window ground is actually. Yeah, I think window ground is very difficult. Um, not because of the language. Uh, so it's because of the language, but also because the images are sometimes um, difficult to pass for pre-trained visual encoders. So I think it might help for we know ground. Um, so I, I recall that for we know ground, clip actually gets worse than random performance or something like that. Um, I think that if you had a larger and more robust language model, it would probably help, but I'm not sure what the, I'm not sure like how much of the bottleneck is on the language side versus the visual side for we know ground. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have like a, concrete answer, but I, I think it would help somewhat. I see. So you also suspect that maybe for window ground, the bottleneck is more on the vision side that the model just doesn't produce distinguishable uh, visual features for like, like uh, grass in a bottle or a grass surrounding a bottle or grass in a bottle. Right. Yeah, I think, I think that's probably true, um, especially for models like Clip, which were trained with contrastive learning. They don't really have, like they don't really learn very fine grained visual features, I guess. So for those two examples, the visual features might be similar because um, yeah, like for contrastive learning, you don't need the you don't need the same amount of granularity, I guess. Uh, are there more questions from the audience? Okay, I can just ask another one of my interest. Uh, so uh, so you mentioned the difficulty or even evaluating uh, this kind of uh, models, but I really mm -hmm. think maybe the in-context learning and also the dialogue ability is going to be a very important ability we want to see in vision language model. So I'm wondering if yeah. you have any thoughts on how we can actually better evaluate these models. Like you already done some efforts on transforming some of the existing benchmark to yeah. evaluate. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. 
Yeah, I think this is a so I think dialogue in general is very difficult as you as you probably know. Um and I think like human evaluation is probably the is still gonna be the gold standard. But I guess I'm I'm also not very sure like how one would compare two similar models. So if you had Fromage and you had another model that can produce images and text. Um I think like aside from interaction with humans, it's very difficult to figure out like which one is better. So we don't have like a good multimodal data set yet. Um, I think some of the benchmarks in this paper in this paper might be helpful, but I think the goal standard is still human evaluations. So I think that as as these kind of models like GPT four and and other um, multimodal large language models become more uh, prevalent, it I, I think it might be possible that like machine learning switches to similar evaluation standards like HCI, where they kind of get like a few people to interact with the system and try it out. And that's kind of like the rating that they report in their paper. So um, a certain like X number of humans think that system A is better than system B. So it might not, it might be less quantitative and more qualitative. Um, I think it would be great if there was like a data set that can measure this, but I think it's very difficult and I'm not sure how we might um, do that for now. Yeah, I'm actually uh, reminded of for, for like evaluating in context learning. So frozen, mm -hmm. they had a set of uh, interesting experiment they call it um, concept binding. So, uh, mm. so the idea is like uh, you give it an image of a known objects, like the image is an image of lion, but you tell the mm -hmm. model this is a picture of 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 some of, of object A, where the object A is right. actually a novel word the model never seen, like Dex. This is just right. something. And what you want to mm -hmm. teach them is to learn that a lion is now called Dex instead of lion, yeah. and then you give it a test image asking what it is. So I wonder if you also test a similar thing uh, on, on this model. Yeah, I, I don't think I tested that. Um, so the focus of this paper was mostly on like the retrieval ability because prior models can't really retrieve images. But I think like that Dex Blicket test is something. Uh, so I think that that is like a test of in-context learning. Um, it's probably a more, so that, that gives you like a quantitative number on my model is like so good at like this amount of performance on in-context learning. I think that kind of stuff is very valuable. Um, I, I didn't try it for Fromage, but I, I think like yeah, in-context learning. Um, so visual storytelling tests in-context learning a bit because you're supposed to produce captions in a certain style. But yeah, I didn't run like the Dex Bicket test. I, I really like that test too. And I think, I think it has like roots in psychology. So I think it's called the walk test or something like that. So I, oh. I really like that, that kind of thing, yeah. Um, any more questions from the audience? Um, yeah, I can ask another one. <laughs> I'm just thinking. Sure. I, in the work, yeah, you mentioned that we can also consider using stronger visual models. Um, mm -hmm. I do wonder uh, if there will be a bottleneck because uh, each image is encoded into one vector. Uh, so will mm -hmm. there be a bottleneck? Like how, I think in NLP, there was a paper called how much you can cram into one single vector. So that was a point on you cannot, uh, it's, or not, no, not you cannot. It's very hard to represent a sentence into one sentence vector embedding. So this can, yeah. send, it can also hold for images. So I wonder what's yeah. your... Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, that's interesting. Because I think, um, I think Ray Mooney or someone said that, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, that's a very good point. So I think one thing that I've noticed is that when you start to treat, so for image captioning, for example, if you treat images as a vector and you get the language model to condition on this and generate the rest of it, um, sometimes what happens is that that vector probably consists of like some high level concepts present in the image. So if I have an image of a sand castle at a beach, it will say like it, it, that vector consists of like beach information probably. And I've noticed that what seems to happen is that the language model will generate a few words, for example, a sand castle. And sometimes the language prior takes over and it knows that if I'm generating the words a sand castle, surely like there's, there's water and there's sand and I'm at a beach. Um, so I think the image vector like provides enough information for the language model to start generating, but sometimes like nearing the end of the generation it no longer conditions on the image and some of the outputs are due to the language prior. So I think like one vector is probably not sufficient for what we want. 
um, it's like very simple and it saves a lot of memory, but I think you are definitely like losing a lot of information there. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. So I, I think I think it's not enough, but I, I don't know if, I don't know like how much is enough, I guess. Yeah, yeah, thank you for the answer. I think it's a very insightful observation that uh, you, if you input the, one, one challenge you are facing now is like the model will rely on language prior and ignore the uh, image context. And I kind of mm. think even if you input multiple image token, you can still face the same problem that model rely on language prior. It somehow seems like yeah. a very hard trade-off because you do want the language prior for all those amazing mm -hmm. But you also wanted to stay truth to the images. Yeah, it seems yeah. like a, a topic to study later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that makes sense. Um, it's also quite hard to quantify whether, um, like, you can look at the attention maps and stuff, but it, it's not always informative, I guess. Um, so I guess it can be hard to quantify whether it's looking at the image or looking at the text. Any more questions from the? Okay, I think uh, if no more question from the uh, audience, then I guess we can maybe wrap it up. Thanks so much, Harold. Thanks again, JY, for a great talk. And thanks, Harold, for, for a really interesting uh, QA session too. Thanks to the audience for coming. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you, Harold, and everyone. It was nice talking to you. Everyone. Bye-bye.